Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I wanted to make a very special announcement because for 19 episodes, the podcast sounded like this. And now, thanks to your Patreon contributions, it sounds like this. So thank you guys so much, everyone who supported on Patreon, for allowing this audio upgrade to happen. I'm so excited for the rest of the episodes of Potterless to sound so much more professional. I could not have done it without you guys, so thank you so much. Also in exciting news, we have a website now. So if you go to potterlesspodcast.com, you will see a stunning website designed by my girlfriend, Kelly Beckman, who did some awesome web design work for us. And the website is fantastic. It's got all the episodes listed. It has ways you can support the podcast, ways you can get involved. And there's so much more potential things we can do in the future with it. So I'm very excited for the future of that website as well. And finally, we need to thank our newest Patreon supporters. So huge shout out to Alex Schultz, Hannah Buffman, and Emily Whiffen, and also to two new producer level patrons, Sadie Bear and Griffin Meckelberg, who used to be a producer level patron, then he had to take a break, but now he's back. So Griffin, welcome back to the producer team. And of course, thanks to the rest of our producer level patrons, Leanne Davis, Andreas Oselby, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, and Michael Vanderslice, who never crack the yolks when they make fried eggs. So without further ado, let's get into episode 20 of Potter, starring Melissa and Ellie, the New York Times bestselling author of Harry, a history. <laughs> Internet, welcome back to Potterless, the journey of a grown man reading Harry Potter for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and we're here today to tackle chapters 24 through 30 of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And I'm very excited because we have a very special guest, a New York Times bestseller, which sounds ridiculous coming out of my mouth, Melissa Anelli. Melissa, how are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? Don't worry. It still sounds ridiculous coming out of my mouth too. Yeah. How does it feel to have that in your Twitter bio every day? Just look at it and be like, oh, wow, I did that. Yeah, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, really? Did that happen? <laughs> it's, it's so nice for feeling. everyone who doesn't know, Melissa wrote a bestselling book called Harry, A History, which kind of just documented the history of the Harry Potter phenomenon uh, because she was very involved with the Leaky Cauldron and all stuff like that. And now you're the CEO of Mischief Management, which puts on Leaky Con and Con of Thrones and Broadway Con, mm -hmm. all good stuff. We specialize in putting passion right into person. Beautiful. I love it. So basically, Melissa is the opposite of me. She knows everything about Harry Potter in the world. Oh and God. it's going to make... <laughs> It's going to be great. So let's get right into it because we have a meaty section of this book ahead of us. Do it. So chapter 24, Rita Skeeter's Scoop. So right off the bat, Hermione reveals to Harry that in order to make her hair look good at the ball, which was a pressing concern for Harry, she used a potion. And she says it's just too much trouble to use all of the time, which is why she doesn't always do it. Yeah. Then Ron and Harry are back to being friendly. Wait, I want to go back. I want to go back. Sorry. You, you hit you hit. Oh, no, go an for important it. No. thing that didn't occur to me because... I'm white, okay. but later on, when um, the suppositions that Hermione could have been black mm -hmm. were started circulating on the net, this was one of the big things that was pointed at oh, and said okay. that it's like a, a call to how difficult it is to straighten black hair. And I had never in my life thought imagine. of it, like, because, you know, I'm, I'm white. We, mm -hmm. we all are the star of our own stories, right? Sure. So we all... So, I don't know. I just thought it was really interesting, and who knows what intention was, but... Uh, I know a lot of uh, young girls of color saw themselves in that moment. It's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. What was she cast as a black or a black girl was cast as her? Was it in one of the plays the play or what was in it? And people London. freaked out. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, part one and two. I saw it. Noma Duzweni just, just won an Olivier Award for it. She is phenomenal. That's awesome. I was super happy about it because, and I've mentioned this in a previous episode, but like nowhere was, is it like Hermione, white girl. They never said anything about her physically, except she has frizzy hair and big teeth. So that could be anything. And there's one mention that some people were saying, <laughs> oh, well, she looks she looks pale in this scene. And it was just like, just stop, stop, stop. Anyone can look pale. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a description Yeah, she looked like skin. pale it's and like... terrified, which, <laughs> you know, anybody can look pale and terrified. A hundred percent. Okay. Ron and Harry are back to being friendly, basically just reaching an unspoken agreement to not discuss their argument anymore, which is not necessarily the healthiest thing, but putting myself in my 13-year-old shoes would be 100% something I would do. Yeah, it's super Ron and Harry, too. <laughs> they <don't, laughs> yeah. They don't like to talk. Very much. So they tell Hermione about Hagrid, the whole giant revelation, which was surprising to them. And she's like, yeah, I figured it out because she's smart. She cites the werewolf 
situation. The whole thing is that people freak out about werewolves in the same way that people freak out about giants, which yes. to me is like, what's the big deal? And that must that's what she's saying is like, come on, Lupin was a perfectly fine teacher. He was a werewolf. Who cares if Hagrid's half giant just means he's large, which is good. And that was a big thing I got into the last episode I recorded uh, with Rosiana about just like all this weird kind of racist undertones with people not liking giants for no reason yeah well it's the same it's the same thing that happened with lupin it's the fear of the mm-hmm. unknown it's you can't teach my child i mean jk rowling doesn't get it out of nowhere it comes all all through history with yeah. teachers of color with teachers who are are different you get parents complaining and it's it's just the, the <laughs> ever the ever circling themes that she brings through these books of um the need for tolerance and the need for a greater understanding of people who are other mm-hmm Exactly. For some reason, Harry still hasn't put the egg in the bath like Cedric told him to do like four chapters ago. He's still convinced that Cedric is messing with him, which doesn't make any sense at all. Cedric is very nice and appreciative of what Harry's done for him with the dragon thing. I don't know why Harry is convinced that he's messing with him just because he's dating Cho Chang. I mean, that's very silly to me. That's why. <laughs> I mean, Harry's, yeah. just being, Harry's just being <laughs> stubborn. And it's particularly Harry. Uh, I don't want to say it's a very boy thing. It's certainly the type of like traditional male you know yeah, thing like that happens the stereotypical thing the stereotypical <laughs> thing it's not nece- it's not just a boy thing but it is in that sense of of um, Harry's going to you know he's he's angry he's like, he's stubborn like, yeah oh. he likes the girl that i have a crush on yeah it's more it's more harry <laughs> than boy but it is definitely <laughs> particularly harry to just be so stubborn and also it makes a better character who's mm-hmm. not too curious that he goes around getting all these answers like one of the frequent frustrations we had with Harry while we were reading this series before it had resolution. So reading it now, reading all seven uh-huh. books now, compared to reading it when you had to wait three years when for it's a book, live. you get so frustrated with Harry for not asking <laughs> questions just yes you know and he's brought up that and way and he even like thinks of them sometimes too and this happened earlier in the goblet like in the beginning of the book there's a lot of things where the narrator will be like harry was wondering why blah 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 but didn't think to ask it's like come on <laughs> she does make it a, a a pass toward explaining this with that the vernon always taught him it's not polite to ask questions and oh, and it does okay. point to an abused childhood it does point to someone who had consequences for being too inquisitive and it's just kind of baked oh, okay. into his personality so it's kind of there but you also still want to yeah. shake him and be like don't you want to know what your parents <laughs> did for a living don't yeah, yeah what yeah. what did they do we know nothing oh man no. so Basically, doesn't want to help out Cedric because of the Cho Chang thing. And Harry's also mad that he explicitly told him the dragon thing. And Cedric only said, like, if you go into the bathtub, yeah. this will really help. And Harry's like, oh, why didn't he just tell me exactly what it was? Like, I did to him. I was kind of annoyed at um, that, too. Aren't the Hufflepuffs yeah. supposed to be fair? Be fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I personally am someone that loves not knowing spoilers. So I love the realization of something surprising happening. Sure. So maybe Cedric was just being a bro and he's like, oh, when it works, he's going to love it as opposed to me telling him. And he had more that's, compunction that's about me. like <laughs> cheating. Like he knew he was kind of cheating. So he's probably a little tug. Yeah, We're so, going to give him a lot of credit. He was having a little tug of <laughs> war with his... Of course. So then uh, the students have Care of Magical Creatures class, but it's not Hagrid this time. It's Professor Grubbly Plank. Grubbly Plank. Which is a name. Huge <laughs> step up from... I love the the different directions that J.K. Rowling's names have gone on. Because many episodes I've made fun of how everyone in the first three books only had alliteration names. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Or, yeah, a lot of, like, Pansy Parkinson and, like, all these other Parvati ones. Parvati Patel, yeah. Yeah. Or you have people named after very obvious things, like Professor Sprout is the plant Sprout, teacher. Sprout, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, so I like that the names are getting more and more complex. So Professor Grubbly Plank is the sub because, quote unquote, Hagrid is indisposed, mm. which I'm guessing he's just upset about the whole giant situation. They don't know why yet mm. at this point. They don't but know it's why it's ominous yet, for sure. Mm-hmm. So she brings to class a unicorn, which is awesome. Harry asks Ron what he thinks is wrong with Hagrid. But while they're having this conversation, Malfoy butts in, of course, with the Rita Skeeter article. It's called Dumbledore's Big Mistake. Giant mistake or big mistake? I think it's big. 
I wrote it in quotes, but it could be giant mistake, be which would be a better pun. I, it could I be either. I just reread it like two minutes ago, so I'm <laughs> I'm not sure. I've got it. I've got, oh, it's giant. Okay, that's better. Good job, Rita. That's a good title. <laughs> so those tabloid Dumbledore's people love their mistake. puns. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's just a giant Hagrid slam piece. It mentions his breeding of magical creatures, the Scroots, which apparently isn't allowed. It reveals that he's not a full-blood wizard and that his mom was a somewhat famous giant named Freed Wolfa, mm-hmm. which again, awesome name. Yeah. Freed Wolfa apparently worked for Voldemort, as did many other giants. So now it kind of explains why people don't like giants as much. And Skeeter mentions that the friendship of Hagrid and Harry exists and that Hogwarts should just fire Hagrid. Yeah. You know, doesn't doesn't really like list any fireable offenses or that he's done anything wrong, but basically the thesis statement of the article is anyway, he should be fired. Yeah, it's really funny looking back at this now through the prism of what we're living through in America mm-hmm. now and Oh god. Oh. Just how on <laughs> point the satire is. It's so Yeah on point like the way she crafts false accusations as told th- as told through a tabloid lens that have just enough racism and bigotry stirring uh-huh. items in them rita knows her audience she knows her audience she's breitbart exactly rita skeeter is breitbart. It's, yeah exactly it's not necessarily that the daily prophet is breitbart but no. rita skeeter the would 100 like she could be tommy lauren or whatever <laughs> <laughs> is the Daily Prophet Fox? I don't know anything uh, about the Daily Prophet except I, like Yeah, this. I think the Daily Prophet is sort of Fox leaning. It's not as bad as Fox, okay. like what's as bad as Fox, but it's not as <laughs> whole cloth fabrication. Like Fox isn't whole cloth fabrication. They just twist. And the Daily Prophet sure. sort of does that. The bright part that would be Rita Skeeter. Yeah. Okay. That's what All I right. think is an apt analogy okay cool glad we're on the same page there (laughs) so so the most upsetting thing in the article to harry is that malfoy was quoted and his quote said that crab got built by a flubba worm and harry's like those don't even have teeth Mm -hmm. like that's what he picks to get the most upset about yeah (laughs) which is just great ron and harry go over to hermione they tell her what's up and she's also mad even though she liked the sub's lesson which is great is that you know learning new knowledge which should make hermione the happiest human being in the world even though she's on cloud nine because of that, this Skeeter article still makes her upset. It's just great where she's like so torn with herself because it's it's a good lesson. She's excited to get a good <laughs> lesson, but her friendship with Hagrid like just overrides. But mm-hmm. man, you could just see Hermione going, oh, but if we could have lessons like this all the time. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's poor, but it just is a sign of, of, of how much she loves Hagrid that that's not enough. Exactly. They don't see Hagrid for multiple days in a row. And they're getting concerned. The squad is getting ready for the next Hogsmeade trip. They see Victor Crumb. He's swimming in the lake. And he's described as kind of like skinny and lanky. Mm -hmm. And this continues to push my biggest gripe with the movies. Oh, so to preface, I've seen the first four movies, but that's it. So that was all I knew going into it. So in the movie, Crumb is just like this big muscle meathead buff person that has no depth. And in the book, yes, he's great at Quidditch, but he's like shy and wants to ask out Hermione Mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And I think they just didn't do him justice. So the book going further to describe him as like skinny and kind of lanky makes me more upset of their casting slash writing decision in the movie. I feel like they just did him so wrong. And he's the most interesting thing in the book to me. Really? Victor Crumb is? Maybe it's because of the movie that it didn't do it justice. Right. I find it just being an interesting thing that you have this 18-year-old kid who's the most famous person in his country, mm-hmm. yet he none of it goes to his head at all, and he is still down to earth enough where he wanted to ask out Hermione, who's like not necessarily described as being popular or attractive or anything, right? And he was scared to ask her on a date, and he's Victor Crumb. I don't know. I just find it really yeah. an interesting character development that got completely ignored by the film. I like that that insight into seasoned athletes. Um, a lot of mm-hmm. athletes are, you know, suave and player, sure. but some of the ones who are really devoted to their sport above all else yeah. aren't the most socially adept. I mean, that's true of <laughs> yeah. everybody who excels to a certain level at anything in life. Writers are famously bad at <laughs> interacting with people <laughs> because they're spending all their time writing. And, they're spending, and so sure. I like that, that she tried to subvert those expectations of what Victor Crumb would be like. It was also a nice foil for Ron, you know, mm-hmm. Ron has this idol <laughs> and of course he wants to hate him so badly and then like you know so and he nice. can't <laughs> but yeah i agree that in the movie they just they just distilled him down to you know almost nothing but they did the same thing with fleur and i kind of understand mm-hmm. why the movies you know you oh, they're so you can't do the same depth you can only do so much yeah 
Unfortunately. That's what I'm really hoping, like, you know, later down the road when they want to reboot, I would love to Television see... Television series! That's what I'm saying. I would love it to be, oh, like, every book is 10 episodes or something, and you can really go into stuff. 20-part BBC great. series. Pride and Prejudice, that. Let's uh, do it. Ah, yes. <laughs> so, Ron mentions that there's a giant squid in the lake, and they're not going to tell Crumb. He does this thing where he's like, oh, I hope the squid gets him, blah, blah, blah. Hermione then tries to go to Ron and be like, come on, he's a really nice guy, but Ron's mm-hmm. having none of it. Yeah, no. So eventually they go to Hogsmeade, they see Ludo Bagman at Three Broomsticks talking to goblins in a low voice, and as I've mentioned on previous episodes, I'm always trying to guess what happens, but I 100% think Ludo Bagman is guilty. I don't know exactly what the situation is, but he is somehow enabling this whole Voldemort situation. Interesting. I don't know how, but there's always like a bad guy, I feel, mm-hmm. and it's got to be Ludo Bagman. Just Wait, because... but you saw the movie. Yeah, but I don't remember it. I saw the movie when I was like 11 okay. and didn't pay attention. Okay. He goes up to the squad, asks to have a private word with Harry, takes him aside, and first off, congratulates him for his performance on the last task. Mm-hmm. And then there's a great joke about how he says the goblins speak gobbledygook, yeah. but then continues to describe it, and then you're like, oh, that's actually the name of goblin language. Yeah. I thought that was great. Great job, J.K. Rowling. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. So Harry asks what the goblins want. Bagman says that they're looking for Crouch. I write the notes as I'm reading the book, so I'm going back and forth between thinking it's Bagman and Crouch at this point. So I wrote all caps, ooh, wait, maybe it's Crouch. So I feel like one of them is at, is at hand. <laughs> but apparently Crouch has been quote-unquote sick for a while, and Bagman is getting Bertha Jorkins vibes, who he says that they're looking for. But it's kind of a weird situation where he's like, oh, I haven't seen Crouch in a while. Same kind of thing happened to Bertha. Yeah, disappearances in the Harry Potter canon are mm-hmm. always as, flags. As Dumbledore mentions in Chapter 30. Yeah, when absolutely. When Harry's like, is Voldemort coming back? He's like, well, last time people went missing, he did. He did, yeah. <laughs> so Bagman then asks Harry how things are going with the egg. And again, it's very weird that he keeps trying to help Harry all the time with the contest. I find that to be very suspect that he's always trying to give Harry an upper hand because you find out the port key is what is supposed to kill the best person, so it would make sense if the bad guy wants Harry to do well, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) A lot of people seem seem to want Harry to win mm. by the end of this thing. Except, except for everyone at Hogwarts. Ah, so, uh, they come around. Yeah. So Harry Harry then just asks him, like, why do you keep trying to help me? And Bagman says he wants help because he feels bad that Harry got stuck in the tournament. But then Harry hits him with the, we're supposed to figure things out on our own, right? And Bagman kind of gives him the, come on, we all want Hogwarts to right. win, right? Right. And then Harry's like, well, did you help Cedric? And then he's like, uh, no. But I didn't because I've taken a liking to you, Harry, which is not justification at all. No. (laughs) And then then Harry, who's sticking up for himself in his stubbornness, is like, I'm almost there. A couple more days should crack it. And I think that's a great unintentional pun Mm -hmm. because cracking the egg. I don't know if Harry meant it, but I hope he did because it would be so good. It's also so British. (laughs) I do love some of the British things. Like like when they said Hagrid should get fired, they didn't. They said he should get Sacked. sacked. Yeah. <laughs> I, I enjoy that word. That it's British fun. Ism. Super fun. So Harry then goes back to the squad, tells him what happened, and of course, Rita Skeeta enters. She asks to talk to Harry Potter, and he says that he wouldn't touch her with a 10 foot broomstick, <laughs> which is, just goes on the list of great Harry Potter comebacks. Yeah, it's definitely clearly muggle, like appropriation of muggle, <laughs> of muggle sayings, and Harry is just kind of. Renegotiate, re, what's the word? I'm rejiggering re- them for his own use. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's pretty cute. He then just flips out on her for the Hagrid article, rightly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's like, well, "Why don't Why don't you tell me more about him?" And gets out the quick quill. Then Hermione flips out, which is great. So then Ron, Harry, and Hermione just leave, and Hermione is absolutely livid. She's you know yelling all these things that she wants to do to Rita. Blah blah blah. Ron tells her to be careful. And to calm down. And then they go back to Hogwarts and head to Hagrid's cabin. When they go to Hagrid's cabin, they knock on the door and Dumbledore answers. So he lets them in. uh, And Hagrid's also there, but he's very sad, understandably. Yeah. Dumbledore's like, come on. To Hagrid says, come on, they still want to know you. And Harry's like, yeah, we don't care what Skeeter said. And, And the best thing of when Harry's saying this to Dumbledore, he says, quote, yeah, we don't care what that Skeeter cow, er, mm-hmm. sorry, Dumbledore. <laughs> like, it's so, afraid, afraid to call her best. a cow. He's like, I've gone deaf. I don't know what you're saying. Exactly. It's great. I have it's gone great. temporarily deaf and did not hear what you said about her. Ugh. I'm Sassy Dumbledore coming out in this book is great. But I like also that Sassy Dumbledore is also with the basic respect for other people, even though she is a horrible foul. Like, cow is a nice word for mm-hmm. Rita Skeeter. Oh, yeah. The, he's still 
as Dumbledore can't be encouraging that kind of behavior. So he's just saying, I've gone deaf. I don't know. Uh-huh. It's kind of like a very, it's a very polite way of being sassy. It's very <laughs> yeah. Dumbledore. Yes. it's He's the perfect mixture of like being sassy without being mean. He's what we should all aspire mm-hmm. to be. Yes. So Dumbledore tells Hagrid that many people have written letters to Dumbledore saying that if they sack Hagrid, that they would have something to say about it and they'd be very upset. So he's just trying to let him know that the people have your back, Hagrid. People like you don't worry about this Rita Skeeter article. Well, it's, so, it's very, it's just so like life. We hear, I think there's some sort of scientific analysis that says that we only hear one good thing out of the 10 that are said to us, but we'll mm-hmm. hear every bad thing. Yes. And building up that skin is so difficult. And I, I think Joe is probably drawing on some of her her writerly things that have happened to her since these books got famous and and tapping into what how that feels yeah i can only imagine you went through the same thing with just any sort of review on the book is like you could get 10 things that are great and then the ones like this book sucked you're like oh no it didn't you have to (laughs) oh my god you have to ignore (laughs) everything it's so hard (laughs) but you do it i feel you once i get my first negative review on itunes for this podcast i'm going to be heartbroken (laughs) no 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 just be satisfied you've made it It, when they hate you you're doing something right so just keep going so true (laughs) so dumbledore goes on to to say you can't get universal acceptance and that's totally fine he says that his brother ebifort again awesome name he said his brother was caught using unapproved charms on a goat oh which is my god weird <laughs> I and i don't. don't i don't want to think about what it could I, even be <laughs> I, you know i don't think it was ever clarified further so i think we're free to let our imaginations run on that one um, mm-hmm. i'm gonna run in not the natural direction uh and and he and he didn't let it get to him so dumbledore then leaves after he tells hagrid i will not accept a resignation from you so very nice move on dumbledore mm-hmm. hagrid then goes on to talk about how great his dad was and then he takes a dig at Maxime for not admitting that she's half giant. You know, he's like, what do you, what do you have to be afraid of? What do you have to be shy of? Like, why would you try to pretend you're someone that you aren't? Hagrid says that Harry reminds him of himself because of the whole growing up without a parent thing. Mm-hmm. And he says that he wants him to win the Triwizard Tournament because, quote, it would show them that you don't have to be a pure blood, which Harry is. So I don't. Don't get it. <laughs> well, but no, Harry. Okay, so Harry is a pureblood. That's true. He grew up with Muggles, so true. to to the racists in the Wizarding World, that would be a negative. That would be a slight on oh, him. Okay. And his family was yes, very pureblood, but was but was Muggleborn sympathizers. So they also consider that you know you know there's a lot of logic that goes with xenophobia. So. True. They consider sympathizers also kind of tainted and oh. unpure, you know. So yeah, yeah. even though he's pure blood, it's to the, the I almost cursed there to the jerks. You're, oh, you're very much allowed to curse on this podcast. Okay, to the assholes, <laughs> it is very much in line. It's almost as bad. It's a it's a mud blood lover. They call it. I think. Oh, okay. So the, yeah, he basically says it would show them you don't have to be pure blood and you don't have to be ashamed of who you are. It would show them that Dumbledore is right and that anyone can get in as long as they can do magic. So a good little message from Hagrid. Mm -hmm. Hagrid then goes on to ask about the egg. Harry lies again, as he's been doing to everyone, about his progress towards it. But this time, this time he feels bad because of all the nice, heartfelt things Hagrid just said. So Mm -hmm. he's like, fine, I'll do the bath thing. And that's the end of the chapter. (laughs) Cedric, you win this one. You win this round. So now we get into chapter 25, the egg and the eye. So Harry, in the middle of the night, sets up a bath in the prefect's bathroom, as, as Cedric you do. suggested, as, as you do. And my question, how does Harry have access? Like, how do you get into he the prefect He gives him the password. Bathroom? Oh, He gives okay. him the password. He, he said the password's pine fresh. But can we just talk about the prefect bathroom for a second? I mm-hmm. would do many things to get a bathroom <laughs> like that. I, it oh, just it sounds, sounds like heaven. Oh, it sounds incredible. It sounds majestic. I would do whatever it takes to be a prefect. I don't know how the prefects are ever not taking baths. Yeah, just chilling in there all the time. Just like chilling. Studying, doing homework, hanging out. It just yeah. seems like an amazing place. It's a good reason to become a prefect. <laughs> exactly. So he uses the Marauder's Map and the cloak to keep it secret. He uses the secret... Oh, I have this written down. He uses the secret code Cedric gave him. So my notes are funny here because I said, goes in the bathroom, parentheses, how does Harry get in? And then uses the secret code, parentheses, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets in. The bathroom is super nice, as we've said. Harry thinks to himself, this bathroom is worth becoming a prefect. <laughs> so Oh, it's what we just said. Exactly. So 
We're on the same page. Interesting little quirk <laughs> about him getting into the bath in this. If you notice, he takes off his pajamas, mm-hmm. then his slippers, mm-hmm. then his dressing gown. So that is a magic Harry Potter indeed. <laughs> was he wearing the i mean you know it's yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a tiniest of nitpick but it's really funny when you think yeah. about it you're like wait a second hang on harry it is funny and there's all this there's a debate i've seen recently on twitter there's a podcast called which please and they have this hmm. big debate whether or not people wear clothes under their robes at school and they're always going back and forth about it and i don't know if it's ever said if they wear I stuff remember underneath. being surprised when the first movie came out that they were wearing clothes underneath and then mm-hmm. kind of went oh yeah i guess for a movie it would be weird if yeah. they weren't, yeah, I don't think they do. I think they do sometimes. I okay. don't think it's the natural state. Oh, interesting. It's uh, fun stuff. So, yes, does this weird removal of clothes situation. But in the bathroom, they have chandeliers. There's a pool with a diving board. There's a gold-framed painting of a mermaid. There's fancy towels. There are specific faucets just for bubbles, one for foam and one for perfume. Best bathroom ever. It's ridiculous. Does nobody notice that Cedric <laughs> just smells flowery all the time? Yeah, or, or that maybe Percy, they just it- Percy being the worst person ever still smells great. Like. Oh, that all the prefects kind of like those great smelling cloud around them (laughs) oh man i'd be Uh. in there all the time (laughs) so harry sets up the bath opens the egg but not underwater and makes that same high-pitched screeching noise it scares him so much though that he drops it and moaning myrtle comes out glad she's made a return oh moaning myrtle and she comes out and tells him to open it underwater and when he does, you can actually make out some sort of song. And it says, come seek us where our voices sound, and we cannot sing above the ground. And while you're searching, ponder this. We've taken what you'll surely miss. An hour long, you'll have to look and to recover what we took. But past an hour, the prospect's back. Too late, it's gone, and it won't come back. And Harry takes it literally because Harry's Harry. He is. <laughs> I mean, I took it a little literally too. I thought it was super creepy, and I was like, "Wow, no, this sounds like a super." It is creepy, but you but you got it. It's part of the most. It's one of the most frustrating and amazing things about Harry is that he just. He's like, they're gonna die. Yeah, they're all gonna die. They're gonna let my friends die. It's Hogwarts. Anything can happen. And you know what? Actually, now you know, now that I'm saying it out loud, I don't blame him. Harry's though. history at Hogwarts actually backs up. Oh yeah. His fear that his friends are going to die it's not like it's been a safe place for him no it's not like it's a well-run school the biggest thing that i will always make fun of and every time i describe the podcast to people they're like oh like what kind of stuff do you make fun of i'm like they had serious black in the school with a knife over ron Mm -hmm. weasley and they didn't send the kids home they were just like teachers walk with them in the hallways that'll be fine right there's a a convicted 12-time murderer that was found in a dorm and they're like we're gonna be fine guys (laughs) Yeah. We have passwords. Yeah. Uh, so not necessarily the best friend in school. I totally support Harry. Honestly, when I read the book and he saved everyone, I was like, great. And then when he got out and everyone's like, why'd you do that? Of course they didn't die or they weren't going to die. No, I was like, like nah, I didn't think so. <laughs> it's also a hero can't just be as good as everybody else. He has to be better. Of course. And so Harry can't just leave Ron there, even if it's reasonable to assume no he has to be a hero and it's harry mm. saving people thing that gets him into trouble down the road i'm not going to spoil you but uh, I'm harry sure loves that. to save people it's a weakness yeah. it's a weakness of a lot of heroes you know this is not like yeah a- any superhero like spider-man got to go back in the thing when the green goblin is pretending exactly. to be an old lady <laughs> exactly good people are easy to exploit mm-hmm. so harry realizes that because of the clues that it's probably some sort of underwater creature. And he asks Myrtle, what li- what lives in the lake beside the squid? And she goes on this tirade about how sometimes she gets sent there because if her toilet is flushed when she's not expecting it, she goes down with it. Which, like, now just makes me confused about ghost physics. Yes. Because she can go through doors, but then water getting sucked through the toilet yeah, sucks her in. <laughs> it makes her head hurt. I don't know. Maybe if... Maybe she can get semi-solid sometimes, and if she's in that yeah. state, I don't it makes know. Me think, I don't know. It makes me think that it's like Patrick Swayze ghost, where if you're really focusing, you can do whatever you want, but if you're not, bad things happen. So maybe you the fact that pottery. she's not expecting, you go through. Yeah, you make some pottery, you take over Whoopi Goldberg. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> as one does. So he sees the mermaid painting and asks Myrtle, oh, is it mermaids? And she's like, oh, good job. You got it way faster than Cedric, which got to make Harry feel good. <laughs> So he's worried because he's not that great of a swimmer and Myrtle gets sad that she can't swim at all and goes on a tangent about how some girl went in asking, are you crying again when found her body? (laughs) 
And then Myrtle mm-hmm. haunted her for the rest of her life, even yep. at her brother's wedding. Like, yep. it goes from Myrtle being this kind of, like, sad, derpy little ghost, like, oh, woe is me, I'm really silly, and I cry a lot. And then she's like, yeah, by the way, I haunted this girl that gossiped about me for the rest of her life. And it's like, whoa, yeah. Myrtle took a turn. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> she was crying about her glasses, and a snake killed her. Mm-hmm. And she was st- she's stuck in adolescence, so she never got to grow up and get mature. Mm-hmm. Sucks for Olive Hornby. <laughs> so Harry's about to leave and checks the Marauder's map before he does, and he sees Barty Crouch in Snape's office, which is super suspect. Mm-hmm. Harry decides, I'm going to investigate because I'm Harry Potter. So he goes down a secret passageway. Wait, I'm Harry Potter, and I'm suddenly <laughs> very curious. <laughs> this is what I do. So... He goes to investigate, goes down a secret passageway, but he drops the egg like the idiot that he is. So Filch hears this and sees the egg, but thinks that it's Peeves who stole it. Well, let's be honest. Harry is, like, covered in prefect perfume. His oh, hands have got to be slippery. Yeah. <laughs> He's wet, you know? He's under an invisibility cloak, so it's clunky. So mm-hmm. I, can, I can forgive him for, jump, for dropping the egg this time. Yeah, I guess I don't forgive it. He should have brought a backpack, right? Like, he should have put the egg in a drawstring bag right or you know magic it or something yeah right magic you can do magic there's magic you can do there's a lot of times when you think harry cast a spell so that you're noiseless can't you do that (laughs) there's so many things i'm wondering about what can be a spell god for hermione the thing i always go back to is that dumbledore made bunk beds and sleeping bags come out of nowhere but you can't call someone If I ever met J.K. Rowling, I would have so many questions. The first 60 would be about Quidditch, and then 61 would be like, what's a spell and what isn't? <laughs> when I when I interviewed her for the book, it was so hard because we, we were supposed to be talking about the phenomenon, going through the whole phenomenon of uh-huh. Harry Potter. And we would just derail into canon. Of course. Because she's the author, and I'm a yeah, big fan. Yeah, how could you not? Like, yeah. yeah. And it's like, I want to ask you all that. But it was, you know, eight hours over two days, and so, you uh-huh. know, I had, we had to get on with our work but it was um yeah very very frustrating oh man my dream situation is that my podcast becomes world renowned and then i get to talk to jk rowling <laughs> and it would be so good she's so she she's seems great. like an awesome person she's she really is. sassy on twitter it's amazing she's got to be she's, great <laughs> she's the best <laughs> oh man so let's see filch thinks that it is peeves and snape comes in and accidentally saves the day by telling yeah. Filch that he knew someone was in his office. He says that the torches are lit and that the spell to lock the door could only be broken by a wizard. So he knows that a wizard broke in to his room. Now, my question for Barty Crouch or whoever is doing this, how do you not turn off the torches? You go into a room, you turn the light on, I, yeah. you steal some shit, and then you're just like, I'm leave the light on. <laughs> it's so It's funny because all these people are very good magicians wizards Mm -hmm. but you know if they were really amazing at their magic there'd be no story yeah that's true (laughs) a lot of like that stuff i i just have to stop and go well it's because there needs to be a story (laughs) they need to you know but it is i get it it's a little bit a little little bit i also think that the hogwarts stuff if you're barty crouch you probably don't have authority to change anything Mm -hmm. at hogwarts like um, i imagine that hogwarts is a little bit more like a little bit sentient maybe sure that's just in my head no that would make sense moody also then barges in and he sees harry potter because of his magic eye but plays it cool and acts like harry isn't there also side note magic eye way better than bionic eye in the movie i don't understand why way better why did they do that well it was still a magic eye it was just that steampunk looking thing in the movie yeah i never understood that either i thought it would be some really cool cgi that they would that they would manage yeah and then they did it with like a a strap around mm-hmm. his head which yeah, yeah I, don't under- I don't i don't i never understood that <laughs> it could have been really cool like rolling around madly not connected to anything with the idea of a magic eye yeah it would have been great or if it was like weird designs in it or something that would yeah been awesome. this i mean like muggle glass eye technology is better yeah <laughs> than the magic version in the book like a muggle glass eye you can almost not tell exactly so the magic one is just you know a giant <laughs> it's like a strap weird to eye patch thing. <laughs> Oh, man. It's weird. Oh, wizards. Moody conveniently gets Snape to go away, and he mentions that some spots never wash off, a.k.a. hinting at Snape being a Death Eater, Mm. but then brings the map to light by doing this. So Snape, because of the map, knows that it's Harry Potter. He's convinced that Harry Potter is there, and Moody is like, I'll tell Dumbledore you have it out for him. And Snape is like, oh, what? I'm just making sure that Harry's not snooping about. He should be preparing for the task which obviously not true. 
Moody sends everyone off and then talks to Harry, and he's amazed by the Marauder's Map. He had never necessarily seen this technology before. Harry tells Moody that Crouch is who he saw in Snape's office, and Moody's very intrigued by this because he says that Crouch is the only person who hunts dark wizards more often than him. Hmm. You know, setting up the future revelations you get about Crouch. Yes. Yes. Harry asks about the rumors surrounding Hogwarts and all these people talking about people behind their back and stuff. And he mentions that Rita Skeeter is what's contributing to this culture. And then mutters that he hates seeing past Death Eaters walk free, which mm. is a hint that Rita Skeeter is a Death Eater, which is like, what? <laughs> Crazy. Oh, I, I never. I thought he was talking about Snape. Oh, maybe it is. But don't you learn later that it's Rita? I don't want to spoil you. Okay, don't, yeah, don't say anything. But she's in the, no, because Rita Skeeter was in the trial that happens in chapter 30. But they don't, they just say she's there. They don't say anything about her. So, right, he might be, he might be hinting at Snape there again. I think he's hinting, I think in this he's hinting at Snape. Okay. Like a death theater that's walked free for him. Mm. And I can't tell you too much yeah. more uh, because yeah. you'll mm-hmm. be spoiled. I love that I didn't even have to tell you don't spoil me. <laughs> so Moody asks to borrow the map. Harry allows it. And Moody says that Harry should be an Auror. Harry thinks he'd like to see how scarred the other Aurors are right. before he decides if that's something he wants to do, mm-hmm. which I think is a great thing. It's like the greatest Auror of all time is like you'd be great at this very hard challenging high prestigious job and harry's like ah but will my face look okay <laughs> yeah well i have to wear a weird strapped on eye <laughs> uh, so then we get into chapter 26 the second task harry tells the squad during charms class where kids are doing opposite of the summoning spell in the class they're doing you know banishing yeah banishing again ron as he does in every book all the time thinks that it's snape he always thinks that Snape is the bad guy, which mm-hmm. means it's not Snape. Anytime Ron says, I think this is the answer, never that answer. Like, that's the surefire that's way. That's not always true. Okay. Ron... Maybe he'll be right in the future. But in the... Well, I'm not, I'm <laughs> yeah. not telling okay. you. Okay. But Ron has an uncanny way of saying something silly and flippant that turns out to be true. Okay. Um, that's like what, in I book guess. three. Yeah. What when it... he says, you're going to be upset. But like when he's doing all those, those fortune telling things. Oh, yeah. You know, and then and there's a lot about this online once you're done with the series. Uh-huh. Go look up, like, Ron's a seer. Okay. There's lots of people <laughs> who think that Ron's actually a seer. Oh, my gosh. That'd be so good. I'm really excited about it. I'm really enjoying Ron in the recent books as he gets, like, sassier and sillier. I love it. Basically, any time a character the best. gets sassy. <laughs> Ron's the best. People who don't like Ron, I just, I just, I don't, I don't have, I don't, we, we can't, we, I don't know how we would ever have anything to talk about. Yeah, at first, when I first started the book, I, I never understood why Ron and Hermione came a thing because I was always like, Harry's the main character. Why isn't it Harry and Hermione? And as I've yeah, more and more- Hollywood working on you. <laughs> as I've more and more read the books, I was like, oh, Ron is way better. Like He's better than Harry well, in so many I ways. Or, better is a, a hard word. Better fit. Maybe he's at least right better for fit Hermione. for Hermione. They're yeah. a better fit. Mm-hmm. If, you look at, if you look carefully at the way that Harry reacts to Hermione when they're alone, it's never- He likes her so much as a friend, yes. but there's- she irritates him. Mm-hmm. She, her tense, over analytical thing really grates him, and he's he's in such a stressed place in life in general. Mm-hmm. He needs somebody calmer. Yeah, is you know my perception anyway. Mm-hmm. Whereas Ron <laughs> brings this humor and grounding to Hermione's yeah. crazy, you know, over analytical crazy. I don't want like to use the word crazy about mm-hmm. women, sure. but <laughs> Hermione is like super super. Uh, detailed mm-hmm. and intense, and Ron is the counterpoint the to that. Yeah. So they're a perfect yin and yang relationship. Yeah, totally. Which is why they bicker. Oh, works out so well. Hermione is pushing for Crouch being at fault. Like she thinks something's going up with him, and Harry decides to write to Sirius, and then starts thinking of how he's going to stay underwater for an hour. Ron and Hermione think that the best thing that he should do is some sort of charm. So they go through tons of research. They're looking up stuff in books in the library, but they they really can't figure out what the best strategy should be. And it gets down to two days before the task, and Harry is absolutely freaking out. He gets a short letter back from Sirius asking Harry to tell him when the next Hogsmeade visit is. So this is building hype me at the time because I'm like, oh, man, he's going to meet Sirius in person. This is going to be great. So Ron asks, why do you think Sirius is asking you when the next Hogsmeade visit is? And the book says... I don't know, Harry said dully, which is so true. Like, Harry is very dense here. Like, I think it's pretty obvious that he wants to meet him in person. (laughs) 
think it's it's yeah, it's pretty obvious he's got some information he wants to impart and doesn't want to put it on a piece of paper because, you know, spies yeah, and stuff. Yep. So again, they're back in care magical creatures class, and there's only two scroots left, and Hagrid has switched to continuing the unicorn lesson. But this time it's about baby unicorns. So not to be outdone, the only thing that could be better than a unicorn lesson is a baby unicorn lesson. Well, Hagrid's <laughs> right, like when he says, you know, I think they're kind of boring. You yeah. know, they're flashy, but Hagrid doesn't think that's interesting. And maybe mm-hmm. it's not. They're flashy and it's cool to see for a second, but otherwise they're just kind of like horses. You know, mm-hmm. so Hagrid's like, well, I didn't think there was much to these. but he's <laughs> And he's definitely right that the babies are more interesting mm-hmm. the way they change and their affinities. Exactly. Hagrid then, while the class is doing stuff, kind of steps aside, checks in on Harry Potter, being incredibly nice. And he's just kind of trying to pump Harry up for the task. He's saying that Harry can do anything he sets his mind to and that he's definitely going to win. Just the best sort of hype man slash father figure that Harry doesn't have. The night before the task comes up and the whole squad is freaking out now. And Ron basically is like, hey, just stick your head in the water tomorrow and ask yeah. the mer people to give whatever they took back and see if they do it. Which, yes. Isn't it funny? Like, <laughs> I love Ron's answers like this where he's like, screw it. <laughs> Just yeah. ask nicely. <laughs> yeah, Ron really has a way of, of like, <laughs> cutting through the BS. Yeah. Harry says that, he's like, oh, man, I really should have been an Animagus. And it's like, dude, nope. you don't get to pick what you get. <laughs> like, And you would have been another stag based on your, is it always, is your Animagus your Patronus or is that not necessarily the same? No, it's not it's not necessarily the same okay. at all. The Animagus, I think it's supposed to be some representative of y- your personality, mm-hmm. and the Patronus is the representative of a, the person who's a protector, oh. for you. or the per- or a person you're in love with. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's super cool. You take on the Patronus of the person you love. So if a couple loves each other, they'll swap Patronuses. Oh, they'll swap. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh man, I didn't know that. That's so cool. Cool stuff. Oh, yeah. love it. See, this is why I love having people that know everything about Harry Potter on the podcast, because I get fun <laughs> facts. Not everything. There's only one woman who knows everything about Harry Potter, and I am not she. True, true, true. But, <laughs> but you're pretty close. I've read it a bunch of times. So friend George come in to get Ron and Hermione, just as Hermione, while she's looking up hexes, asks, who would ever want to turn their nose hairs into rings? Which I think is great, because Fred and George are definitely the people that Absolutely. would want to do that. <laughs> they probably already have. Exactly. So Fred and George say that McGonagall wants them. And immediately, this has to be them being the bait for the mermaids, and Hermione's for Crumb, and Ron is for Harry. As I'm writing this, this is my prediction, and then, of course, two seconds later, you learn that this is what happens. So, Harry keeps hitting the books, but with no luck. He falls asleep in the library, and he wakes up to Dobby, telling him to get up, because the task is about to start in ten minutes. Which raises a lot of questions. First off, shouldn't the teachers have been a little more concerned, like, an hour before the task that Harry hasn't shown up? No one went to get him? Yeah. I don't understand. Is anyone wondering? You know, everyone's just sitting there. They're like, well, you know, he'll show up eventually, right? (laughs) No one's checking in on him. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Dobby knows the task. And he also knows that Ron is the one taken. And he tells Harry this. He then gives Harry gillyweed, which... In the movie, Neville gave it to him, right? Why did they change this? Probably to cut down on the budget of making Dobby for no reason. (laughs) Oh, that is true. That's a really good point. Yeah, if you don't need him in the movie, why why go through the the effort? And honestly, I was kind of disappointed because, one, I hate Dobby. I know everyone loves. Do you really? I know everyone loves him, and they're like, "Oh, is he like your what? Jar Jar?" Yeah, like he's so annoying. He does nothing. Can I just good. say he's pre Jar Jar? No, he definitely does good. I'm things. sure he'll do good things in the end, but so far in books two and now four, <sighs> he hasn't done anything of value except like drop pudding, try to break Harry's arm, uh, talk in the third I can't person. React. <laughs> yeah, I, can't I know. React I, without I, I know you. that he has to do it because everyone loves him by the end. So I he's can't gonna... react without spoiling you. <laughs> I know he's going to do something awesome. No. I'm holding on hope. But it is funny right now that I'm in this place where I'm like, guys, Dobby's awful. And everyone's like, no, he's the best. And I'm like, prove it. <laughs> but I'm sure he's going to do I something. I do amazing. agree that when he shows up in two and basically almost kills Harry a hundred times. Mm-hmm. I Yeah, I get mm-hmm. it. But Dobby is a good heart. Yes, I'm sure he's going to be great. He just <laughs> hasn't done that yet. Mm-hmm. So I kind of liked it better. In the movie, I like Neville helping him out because I feel like Neville's just been kind of like shit on the whole series. It would be great if, if he did something useful. And he's supposed to be, like, really good at herbology and stuff. I thought it would have been... I liked that that was a thing, and I kind of was upset that it wasn't 
the actual canon thing that happened. I think it's fine. I mean, I, don't know. I think it's fine either way. Yeah. Neville's interested in herbology, so it makes a lot yeah. of sense. So Gillyweed basically makes you able to breathe underwater. So Harry, since he only has 10 minutes, just grabs it and is like, sure, I'm going with this now. And he runs to the challenge, gets to the judges table, and Percy sasses him for almost being late. Fuck off, Percy. I Yeah, yeah. Like, real talk, the bad guy in the Harry Potter series is Percy Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> he's so much worse than Voldemort. He's so annoying. He's just, Don't we all know a Percy, though? We Don't do. We all know? And that's why... I think that's why I relate to hating him more than Voldemort <laughs> because like yeah. I know Percy's in real life and I'm like, Ugh, the worst, <laughs> the worst, the oh. worst, those cauldron bottom reports. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the test starts, Harry eats the gillyweed and then he enters the water, which is freezing. The gillyweed starts to take effect, which gives him gills and webbed feet and webbed hands. And then Harry just starts swimming. At first it makes him feel like he's drowning as he's like transitioning from breathing to gills but then once he's underwater in like gill mode he feels great so he starts swimming super fast and he runs into a bunch of grindylo which is a underwater is it a plant or an animal i think it's a plant that just tries they're, to, an, animal. they're an animal okay. they're an animal and they try to like snatch harry up but he avoids them Myrtle is floating nearby, asks him how's it going, <laughs> which I think is great. She's like, oh, hey, what's yeah. going on, Harry? She points Harry in the right direction, and then as he starts going this way, he hears the mermaid song. So as he gets closer and closer, he sees a rock with people painted on it. Time is halfway through, and then he sees the people eventually. Right. So there's basically like this underwater town slash village, and the four people that are from the people in the task are tied up to a statue so it's ron harry or sorry ron hermione cho chang and fleur's sister so, so my first note of this it's gotta suck to be the dude who took fleur to the ball the other two is like love interest love interest and then not that guy not that guy like <laughs> so that got hit that had to be a blow to him when he realized like oh man yeah harry needs he needs something sharp to cut the weed which is tying Ron to the statue. So he finds a rock and he cuts Ron free. And then while he's down there, since he got there first, he's like, well, I'm going to cut Hermione's too. And while he's doing that, the mer people try to stop him. They're like, no, 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 you can't do this. I just have, I just, the people who were arguing back way uh -huh. back in the day for Ron, for Harry and Hermione being uh -huh. fated, were using the fact that he saved her as proof oh that's dumb yeah it was not the best argument i could have thought of yeah. in my life and it was like well she's his friend yeah and he has a saving yeah, he people also thing. then saves he... fleur's sister <laughs> like, yeah he also saves fleur's sister is, is he in love with fleur's sister <laughs> yeah it was yeah i found that i found that line reasoning of problematic whatever, particularly yeah yeah problematic problematic oh, reasoning so the other champions are not in sight and he's like well i gotta i gotta save these people but finally cedric comes in cedric tells harry that the other two are on their way Cedric has a giant bubble over his head, which I think, great choice. And Crumb is a half man, half shark, which I think is okay. just the funniest Half solution. man, half shark. I understand how Harry's transfiguration skills are not up to the task. But with all the searching they were doing, did no one find the bubble head yeah, charm? Yeah, I don't get how they didn't like, get either Harry, of Harry, maybe two. there's something you can put around <laughs> your head, like a bubble of some sort. I wonder if there's a charm. <laughs> a bubble head charm. Like, with all the searching they were doing, they never came I across it. find it hard to believe that Hermione <laughs> yeah. didn't know about the yeah. bubble head charm. I'm just no, going to oh, say that. Completely valid. And the other thing, I don't know if you remember, I don't know the name of the show, but there was like a cartoon from the 90s where the people were like shark tops and then wore like jeans for bottoms and they were all muscly and they like rode I, skateboards I, there's and a stuff. memory of it someplace i don't know but every time i think of that i imagine that crumb turned into one of those and then also how dangerous he could have like bit oh, hermione's head off while trying to undo 100 percent yeah <laughs> It's just <laughs> reckless. Yeah. So because of this half man, half shark thing, Harry has to give Crumb the sharp rock to cut Hermione loose because the teeth wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So those two guys are there, but Fleur is nowhere in sight. So Harry takes out his wand to free her sister. He does like a three, two, one to get the mer people to go away. Basically like threatens them. And then as he mm -hmm. holds them at wand point, then he cuts... Uh, Fleur's sister free with the rock so he has Ron and he's got Fleur's sister and he swims to the top very slowly and he's struggling because as he's swimming up he's turning back into the human now while I'm reading this I am so stressed 
because I didn't remember from the movie if he like gets out or whatever happens. So the whole time I'm like, oh man, please tell me everything's okay. Right. Finally, he breaks through the surface and the crowd goes nuts. And the best thing is the first thing that Ron says to him is, wait, you thought that mermaid song was for real? Like there's no way Dumbledore would let anybody die, <laughs> which yeah. I think is great coming from Ron because if you flip the roles, like there's, of course, Ron would 100% take it literally also. Sure, but they also like, Ron, Hermione, and Fleur's sister went to sleep and woke up and everything was fine. When you're down there in a lake, <laughs> and, you know, so now now I'm once again on Harry's yeah. side. You're in a terribly, it's like being in a scary yeah, movie. Yeah, you're not. Your ambiance changes what you uh-huh. think of reality, you know, of course. Yeah, yeah. Now that I'm thinking through this, of course Harry <laughs> thought he had to stay there and save them. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Fleur apparently was attacked by the Grindylows, and she is very appreciative of Harry. So Fleur gets 25 out of 50. Cedric gets 47 out of 50 because he was one minute past the allowed hour time. Crumb gets 40 out of 50, and Harry gets 45 out of 50. I don't understand how Harry didn't get the you save someone else bonus points, but... I guess he, I mean, he got them, but not enough to make him win. He yeah. did. They, he got like more moral fiber. They gave him moral fiber Very points convenient. and they also so conveniently the third brought and him final... tied with Cedric. Convenient for the next plot point. Exactly. The third and final task is announced to be that it will take place on dusk of the 24th of June. The champions will learn what is happening one month prior. And Harry decides that he's going to give Dobby socks for every day of the year as a repayment for giving him the gillyweed. And that is the end of chapter mm-hmm. 26. And that is the end of this episode of Potterless. So we're going to we're gonna put a stop to it here. But then Melissa and I will be back on the next episode to discuss chapters 27 through 30, which is some deep stuff in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. But Melissa, thank you so much for being on this episode of Potterless. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. And is, is there anything in particular you'd want to plug? Like maybe LeakyCon or your own stuff or anything? Yeah. LeakyCon is coming. It's Labor Day, and it's in Dublin, and we've got a lot of amazing guests. Um, Alf, sure. Alf, Dean Thomas. Uh, let's just call them by their character names. Dean Thomas, Cho Chang, um, uh, Tom Riddle from Book Six, uh, Luna. <laughs> uh, there's more <laughs> at LeakyCon.com. We have the Wizard Rock Bands coming. We have a whole fandom celebration. Co- it's gonna. It's going to be phenomenal. We're very excited about it. And yeah, check out uh, Broadway Con and Con of Thrones and all the things that we got going. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this. And internet, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say at Hogwarts, wizard on. Do they say that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that's, that's just what I say at the I end of I was like, I episode. didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the best reaction I've ever gotten. <laughs> Potterless was created by Mike Schubert, it is hosted by Mike Schubert, it is edited by Mike Schubert, it is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Griffin Meckelberg, Andreas Ozelby, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vanderslice and Sadie Baer. The web design is by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find us at Twitter, at PotterlessPod, at Facebook.com slash Potterless, Instagram.com slash PotterlessPodcast, and PotterlessPodcast.com. You can subscribe to us on your preferred podcasting app, and if you'd like to support the podcast, you can head over to Patreon.com slash Potterless, where you can donate money in exchange for bonus content. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening, and until next time, wizard on! Wizard on!